Sometimes we pray at a situation. Intercession stands in the shoes of and prays on behalf of as though it was our own issue. You pray for your neighbor. It's not just praying at them, but we pray as though their struggles are ours. And this is incredible. Jesus and the Holy Spirit both put on our shoes and pray for us as though our issues were theirs. So we move on to verse um, 20, let's see, 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. We don't know, I mean, are you got weakness? Anybody aware of those? Uh, yeah. But we probably wouldn't have listed the one he listed. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So he considers it a weakness for us not to know what to pray for. Verse 27, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, I don't know how you look at this. This is how I look at it. God, I want a million dollars. And then I pray in tongues. And the Holy Spirit says, man, don't give him a million dollars. <laughs> do, do not listen to that last request. Because we're trying to make him like Jesus, and that'll only mess things up. <laughs> he always prays exactly according to the heart and to the will of God. He knows exactly the tools, the elements, the issues that will take us to where we are all headed. We are all, we've all been predestined, according to Scripture, predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus. So everything that he does in us, he works in us to that end, that the end result was we would adequately, uh, adequately represent Jesus well. Now look at verse 28. This is a verse that is quoted uh, very often out of this chapter. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Look at it again. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I'm not a cook. My job is to buy cookbooks. <laughs> because I married a cook. That's my job to inspire her. <laughs> and th thankfully, she's easily inspired. I did a fast some years ago, maybe heard me confess my sins. I did a, a long fast, and during that fast, I bought 29 cookbooks. Over, <laughs> I even bought a deep fryer, and we don't eat fried foods, but I was dreaming of sweet potato fries. <laughs> Figured that's the will of God for my life, so I bought a deep fryer. And I love Amazon.com, the one-click thing, you know? You buy a book on there, and with just one click, boom, it's mine, it's in the mail. And then it says, those who bought that cookbook also bought these. <laughs> and I look at them and I think, and I see why. Click, that one's mine too, and click, that one's mine. So I'm, I'm not a cook, I suppose I could, my wife is encouraging me to learn with her so we could cook together. So who knows, it could happen. <clears throat> but let's just say we were going to make some cookies today. You need some sort of flour, you need butter, or it's, or it's just a cracker. If there's no butter, it's, it's, I don't know, it's something else. It's not a cookie. <laughs> butter, you need some sort of sugar. I like coconut sugar. It's, it's, it's healthier, and I, I like the flavor. So we got butter, we got flour, we got sugar. I don't know, you may want oatmeal. I like oatmeal. Chocolate chips. Yeah, no, no raisins, no raisins. Can't make it as a grape. We don't want you in our cookie. Yes. So, I'm sorry if you like raisins, but I just would rather avoid them. It's, uh, I like them in their pre-spoiled form, a raisin, uh, a grape, a grape, anyway. And then maybe you add some vanilla extract. You ever taste vanilla extract? Nasty. Nasty, nasty. 
But somehow that nasty thing enhances this entire recipe. And most everyone in this room has some nasty ingredient in your life that when it gets worked into the entire recipe that testifies of God's grace, suddenly that which you didn't like takes on meaning. It illustrates the redemptive work of Christ. It models, illustrates grace. And a lot of the things that we would remove while he didn't cause, he has decided, I'm going to demonstrate all things work together for good. I'm going to use every part of the recipe, and the end result will be, you'll be like Jesus. That's his ambition. That's his vision for us. Verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> I love that verse so much. I don't know why. I, I guess it's, it, how many of you know people can be against you? Demons can be against you. The devil can be against you. He's not saying nobody can be against you because God is for you. He's just saying, if God is for you, no one else gets to vote. <laughs> no one else gets a say in the outcome. They can have their opinion, but the council is comprised of God. If God is for you, nobody can be against you that counts. Here's the verse that would probably do us well to prayerfully meditate on for about 20 years. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Look, look at it again. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how she, shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Stunning verse, stunning verse. Uh, biblical meditation seems to be almost a lost art, at least in many circles. Um, Eastern meditation is you empty the mind. Biblical meditation is you fill the mind. It's completely different. Uh, Eastern meditation actually opens you up to a spirit world, realm, where you, you can easily come under the influence of an evil spirit. Biblical meditation is joining your mind with the mind of Christ. And considering, actually, probably the best illustration of meditation, biblical meditation, is a cow chewing its cud. It brings it up to chew over and over and over again. That's what meditation is, is you take a thought, a verse, and you review it, you pray over it, you think about it, you maybe quote it, you write it on paper, put it on the dashboard of your car. It's just something you review over and over again because you can tell there is something here for me and I don't want to glance over it quickly. I want to make sure that the full impact of this verse hits me. This is one of them. How can this father who freely gave us his son to suffer in ways that are unimaginable, how would he do something so extreme and not also include everything else that is short of that extreme? If he did this, do you think your car payment doesn't matter to him? Do you think it's possible for a father that is that good to go to this extreme to not care about what you care about? We make him this religious feature that cares about spiritual things and nothing else. And it's just not consistent with the testimony of Scripture. It's not consistent with the lifestyle, the model that Jesus himself gave for us. And so here's this statement, a statement that could stand by itself for eternity. How shall he who gave us his son to not only die a most gruesome death, but to carry upon his flesh the weight of every sin of every human being in all of time, the most gruesome death ever experienced because of that. How could there be anything that would come up in our life that wouldn't matter to him? Amen. This chapter is to endear us to the Spirit of God who models and illustrates this kind of father, who models and illustrates this kind of compassion, this kind of Deep, deep, deep concern. 
Jump down to verse, excuse me, verse uh, 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Here's the interesting thing. Verse 26 and 7 says, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. 28 says, all things work together for good. 34 says, Jesus makes intercession for us. I wonder why everything works out. <laughs> what does intercession mean? It means to stand in the shoes of another. It's, sometimes we pray for people, forgive me, but I've, I've seen this for years. People will pray for, in fact, I'm at the back door once, a lady that was visiting met me at the back door and said, I want you to agree with me and to curse the city of San Francisco. I said, no, I said, I'm not going to be doing that. So she tried to cast a demon out of me. That was interesting. She said, come out of him, you foul spirit. I said, yeah, yeah, go. Just, just go. Sometimes we pray at a situation. Intercession stands in the shoes of and prays on behalf of as though it was our own issue. You pray for your neighbor. It's not just praying at them, but we pray as though their struggles are ours. And this is incredible. Jesus and the Holy Spirit both take, put on our shoes and pray for us as though our issues were theirs. And they're approaching the Father, not because he has chosen evil and they're trying to talk him out of it. There's been that concept for years that couldn't be any more wrong. It's the Holy Spirit and Jesus that are coming before the Father because prayer is his assignment. It is his will. This is how the economy of heaven functions. There is a partnership and there are requests. And in this request, the partnership of God and man or the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is illustrated through perfect unity, perfect camaraderie. Yeah. And here they pray for you and for me and sandwiched in between the testimony of God praying for us is the covenant promise. It'll all work and it'll all work for good.